project called the Heritage Languages Program Research Project. And it's led by uh, my supervisor, Dr. Jeff Bale. Um, and just a little bit of background information on me. I have been an ESL teacher at the university here for about eight years. Uh, and I completed my master's program here under the supervision of Dr. Andrea Sturzik. Uh, and um, I've been at the University of Toronto now for two years. I'm studying in the Department of Curriculum Teaching and Learning, um, Language and Literacies Education, uh, with a specialization in policy. So uh, with that said, my colleague, Kiana, she's in her third year of her program. She's uh, uh, researching heritage languages and also language policy assessment. Kiana, you want to say hi? Sure, hi. Um, Jennifer, can I see you or like, um, the... You'd have to stand in front right. of the laptop. I think... I, I see like white wall, yes. Okay, I think the only thing you can see is either me or the PowerPoint. No, I'm, I can see both. Oh, you can. But I don't see you she in the... Uh, so yes, she just yes. Wants to see you. Do you see me now? Yes. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay, okay, we're good to go. Um, anything you want to say, Kenna? No. Okay, so the presentation we're going to share today really is uh, a discussion on the application of research method to a historical investigation um, in relation to a language education policy in Ontario. And it's a highly contentious uh, political um, uh, issue in Ontario, and that's the Ontario Language Heritage Language Program. Uh, before we start, though, I thought um, it's really critical that uh, we take a moment, uh, a moment of pause, uh, to think about uh, where we are today, uh, the land that we're on. And I want to draw your attention to uh, discourses on decolonization, uh, specifically as they get taken up in institutions like the university here. Um, in the form of very formal, um, routine land acknowledgements. And so, in thinking about this today, uh, I am reminded of an article by Tuck and Yang, uh, 2012, um, called um, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. So then rather than just reading the land acknowledgement, I'd like us to just take a moment of pause uh, and reflection, personal self-reflection for ourselves, um, and to think about our uh, shared histories and, and our struggles of the past. So we'll do that now. Thank you. So our project is a historical one. And the purpose of today's presentation is twofold. The first thing we're going to do is talk a little bit about the heritage language uh, policy and the program. And then we'd like to get a little bit into um, the research design, specifically looking at policy genealogy as a methodology um, to, in the context of the Heritage Language Program. And then, um, of course, we will have a discussion, and I'm sure there will be questions to be asked afterwards. If there are any clarification questions you'd like to ask while I'm presenting, uh, please feel free to pause and just ask me to be a more kind of informal conversation today. Um, all right, so before we start, it's important to know that when we use the word heritage language, we're referring to languages other than English in, and French, so not English and French. Okay, so um, we're part of a team. Uh, I sent the PowerPoint to my professor, Dr. Jeff Bale, who's leading the project, and I have his photo here, and uh, he went in and changed the photo to a photo of our research team here. So here's our stellar research team. We're on a Skype call. Um, it doesn't look like we're very interested in the project, but I assure you that we are. Um, there's, there's several of us actually uh, joining at different various components of the project. Um, some as volunteers, some as um, paid assistants as our, as our job. Um, Eve Hock, the associate professor at York University, has also contributed to this project. And as I said, it's led by Dr. Jeff Bale. Okay, so we have a primary goal, an overarching goal of, of our work. And that goal is to reveal how implementation and contestation of the Heritage Language Program contri contribute to regulating racial and linguistic difference in multilingual contexts such as Canada. And um, most of the studies that look at this phenomenon, that look at um, how language hierarchies are created, are looked at it from a federal level policy. 
And our, our research is taking that up in a provincial level. And that's because, as we know, education in Canada is mostly, is mainly regulated by the province. So we're looking at that phenomena in the provincial level in the context of Ontario. Okay, so a little bit about uh, what is heritage language. What is the heritage language program? So in 1977, the Ontario Ministry of Education uh, released this policy document called Memorandum Number 4046, and they sent it out to um, two different groups of people, directors of education and principals of schools. And really, this memorandum, this two-page document, became the, the guiding and the official policy of heritage languages in Ontario. Um, and here's what this document did. So it, it made it that it, the policy authorized 2.5 hours of instruction, this says, per week um, in schools, in elementary schools. And this was upon the request of a sufficient number of parents. And the sufficient number is uh, 25. So if 25 parents requested a heritage language to be taught at school, then they would approach the board, and the board would decide whether or not they would implement that heritage language at that school. So the, the, the ministry really gave the decision-making power to the board. Okay, so from that policy uh, document, they said, okay, the boards get to decide w whether they offer it or whether they don't offer it. Um, and it really was, um, even though the, the policy document said that the, the, the school day could be extended by 30 minutes, most of the courses were offered on weekends or after school. Um, there was no um, official change to that five-hour structure of the curriculum. And it's important to know that it was housed under the continuing education branch, so not the, the curriculum branch. And that the teachers of this program were not certified Ontario teachers. They could just be language speakers, heritage language speakers. Okay, um, oh sorry, one point here that I didn't say, language as a subject. So this is important here. So uh, this it could be a subject of instruction, so uh, like learning Ukrainian through Ukrainian, but you couldn't use it as a language of instruction. So you couldn't teach a math class in Ukrainian. You couldn't teach a science class in Ukrainian or in Korean, or something like that. Okay. The program um, was, was implemented in 1977, as I said. And of course it created uh, quite a lot of controversy. Um, and we can see that in the media, media headlines, which I'll show you in a bit. But 10 years later, um, the ministry released what they called a proposal for action. And there's a lot that happened in these 10 years. Um, a lot of uh, efforts to, to increase the status of heritage languages in the school system, including a series of four private member bills um, all of them failed. So when this proposal for action um, got released, one of the main differences between this policy document and this one is that it now mandated school boards to offer the courses. So no longer did they have the option to offer. So as soon as 25 parents said, yes, we'd like the course, then the, the school boards were required to offer um, the program. Okay, we might think, oh, look, it looks quite progressive, but if we look at the actual uh, Education Act, it is illegal to teach in a language other than English and French. So uh, that is different than in the context of Saskatchewan. Uh, I, I looked at the policy differences between Ontario and Saskatchewan, and um, it is legal in, in Saskatchewan to teach a uh, heritage language. It is illegal in Ontario to teach a heritage language. Okay, so I'll just let you look a little bit at some of the controversy highlighted here in some snippets of the media headlines. So the media, they did a really good job of creating this binary of, of people either for the Heritage Language Program or against the Heritage Language Program. But our um, research efforts were not really necessarily, while that binary is important, we're more interested in um, not whether or not the heritage language is a good program or not a good program. We're, we're interested in, in much more than that. So I'll just share a couple of examples of angry letters. These angry letters came from citizens um, 
Uh, so just have a look. Maybe can you read it, or do you want me to read it out? Yeah, you can read maybe it. It's, maybe I'll read it out. Okay. So the first one here, we'll just go to this. Language is now creating problems in Canada that will seem to be leading us to the brink heretofore unthinkable. Will Ontario be the first to launch yet another program that will become uncontrollable and irreversible without creating further schisms in our Canadian society? Or the one down here. I am sick of these newcomers to our country crying at every opportunity that they, will, that they are being discriminated against when it is we, the poor, stupid taxpayers, who are the ones being discriminated against. And damn right, we do resent the added cost to our taxes. Okay, and this one, um, one of my favorites. I'm also tired of hearing about racism in the schools. Sure, we know a certain amount of, a certain amount exists, but let's not blow it out of proportion. Racism and discrimination is on both sides. It isn't just against minorities. If some of the things that are recommended are implemented in the schools, I fear that a teacher will be afraid to look sideways at a child for fear of being called a racist and possibly losing their job. Who is to decide in such matters? Or what happens when a black student and a white student are caught fighting? Is it going to be looked at fairly? Let's we'll skip to the end. Let's have a little sanity and fairness and not get carried away. Remember, whites have rights too. Okay. Where is that, Jennifer? This one here? Yeah, it could have been yesterday. <laughs> uh, this would have been in the most likely the early 1980s. <laughs> Okay, so some of the pros of the argument for heritage language is that, that there was language maintenance, um, also a respect for multiculturalism, and also re multiculturalism recognized in our education system, seeing uh, multiculturalism as a resource, a social um, capital resource. Um, the cause, um, as we can see kind of in the letters, is related to finance, and also this idea of ghettoization which is also cited in some of our, our findings. Okay, so here's where we're looking at, um, I'll talk a little bit about policy genealogy, and this is our methodological uh, framework that we're, we're looking through when we are um, analyzing what we're doing here. And policy genealogy differs from traditional approaches to historical research in that we're not looking at um, a trajectory, um, a linear, storytelling of what happened in the past from recalling events from the past to the future. So what we do with policy genealogy is we start in the present and we start with a problem in the present and that problem that we're narrating is the status of heritage language in Ontario schools. And so we look at the problem and um, we're, we want to um, challenge the problem and which we often think of as something that's natural or something that's normal or something that's immutable. And what we're doing is we're looking back and we're, we're trying to discover potential discontinuities and we want to identify ruptures in how policies emerge and how policies change over time. So uh, that said, I think this quote nicely by Garland nicely really sums up what it is um, that policy genealogy is doing. We're, we're aiming to trace the struggles, the displacements, the processes of repurposing out of which contemporary practices emerged and to show the historical conditions of existence upon which present day practices depend. Genealogy views the process of descent as the outcome of power struggles and battles over domination, use, and need. Okay, so the, 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 the the good thing about policy genealogy is that when we focus on these discontinuities, we can see how um, what we perceive of to be seemingly unchangeable structures and ideologies of our present are in fact the result of past um, struggles and conflicts, um, some successful, some um, not successful. And, and in this sense, we're really inviting an openness to, to look at history. And, and then we're, genealogies are calling us to disrupt these taken for granted assumptions and these ideologies and really um, look at ways to rectify what, what we call as the status quo. So they really uh, allow us to provoke, provoke us, so, sorry, Fendler says they provoke us to think and act differently so we, we might imagine and enact different possibilities for our future. So to me this, this is, is quite hopeful 
um, in, in framing this kind of problem of the past. Instead of thinking, oh, we're stuck in the past, it's always been that way, we have different possibilities for managing, uh, imagining what we can do in our future. Okay, so a little bit about our uh, data, where our data is coming from, what we're doing with our data, how we're analyzing our data. Um, we collect our data from the archival documents and we are collecting them from the late 1970s all the way up until the 1990s. And we've collected them so far from the archives of Ontario, the Ontario Federation of Teachers, the TDSB, the Toronto District School Board Archives and Museum, as well as um, the historical collections in newspapers, so like the Globe and Mail and the Toronto Star. And so far to date, we have collected over 9,000 files um, in our database. So we've got lots. Um, this is a picture that is on the wall of uh, my supervisor, Dr. Bale's uh, office door. And um, I'll just read the quote here. It says, genealogy consequently requires patience and a knowledge of details, and it depends on a vast accumulation of source material. So he's written success here. So we've got, we've got our source material, over 9,000 files. Um, we're working on the patients part here. <laughs> okay, so what do we do once we um, go to the archives? So in this photo here, uh, what we do is we open up one of these uh, boxes, and in the box we have files here. We take out the files and um, we take a picture of all the documents in the file, one by one, and um, with our phone, and our phone converts them into a PDF, and then we enter it into a system called Zotero. Um, so we're using Zotero. Have, have you heard of Zotero? Uh, it's like a citation management system. So we're using Zotero to record the files and manage all our massive amounts of data. So what we'll do is we'll make an entry for every policy document, and we name it, and then we link up the photo that we took, the PDF photo, with the, with the entry here. And we do a couple of things after we link it. So the first thing we do is we write a descriptive notes. So if someone reads through the file, they take a summary of it, they write a descriptive note. And then if there's anything kind of juicy that stands out or any kind of analytical piece that we see, we write an analytical uh, note as well. So for each of these files, we have all descriptive notes and some have analytical notes. And then we also tag them. So when we are reading the file, we look at um, the policy actors. Um, we look at um, who, who, who it is. Is it a memo? What kind of document it is? Um, what are they referring to? Are they, are they talking about specific languages? Are they talking about a specific program? And so we have, um, we have a uh, convention that we use to tag each of these documents. Oh, I forgot to say, the PDF files are text readable. So that allows us to open a PDF file and just type in um, American Sign Language and see if, they're, if that's in the actual text document. So how do you we convert our PDF file. We have a program that converts it into a text-readable PDF oh, file. Oh, what's the program you use for that? That's a good question. I don't know the name of that. That's a really important key piece of what you guys are doing in terms of being able to turn those photos into searchable documents. Yeah, that's right. right. That's right. And it's about, so far, 80% accuracy. Um, oh, really? Because there's handwritten notes and sure. things like right. that. We can't get that. Right. But it's pretty good. Uh, I'll get back to you. I'll ask um, Dr. Bale and uh, yeah, the name be great of that. So you can see it. Yeah. Um, so then we, we can just type, uh, so we have the folders on the left-hand margin here, a big file HLP, and even though we're not documenting this as a linear project, we have set up, we, we need to think about how to start grouping these together. So we set up folders for years, we set up folders for um, media files, but within the years, uh, if you click on one of the years, I clicked on 1987, here we have um, all these documents. Uh, double click on the document, it opens it up, all the notes are there, and I can search here, and if I type in the word proposal, all of the documents with proposal will, will, will be there. So, um, lots of trial and error with this process of trying to figure this out. Yeah. And so you said that you're using tags, right? Yeah. And so, uh, this is Mac that you're using here. So, you're okay. using the tag process, and so you can then use Mac OS to actually search your tags, or does that happen within Zotero as well? It happens within Zotero. I'm not sure, I've never tried it outside of Zotero with the Mac OS, 
But if I if I go into Zotero um, and I just click on the folder, whatever the tags, so here are the tags. Here, if I type one of the tags, it then, will then all the will it will populate all the ones that are connected to that tag. So using that search function allows you to search through the tags, but Correct. also allows you to search through the text of the documents depending on what it is that you write in. Correct. Okay. No, no, no. You can only search through the documents when you click on the documents and then you, you search in the find oh, function. Oh, I got you. But you, yeah. can, you, click, you can search through the folder to find the tag. Yes, correct. Okay. So we've tagged it and then <coughs> within those Because essentially that's, that it's a level of coding, right, that that's you're right. doing there. Yeah, that's right. As a way Organizing. To kind of yeah. Organize, yeah. So yeah, that if you right. want to write something on a particular aspect, that's you're right. easily able to retrieve all of the however many out of the 9,000 that are applicable to that particular issue. And that's our goal, absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the goal of that. Cool. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Lots of, lots of trial and error uh, for this. I mean, we had no idea what to do with all this data and all this mass mm -hmm. amounts of information. And we don't know um, exactly like how specific to get, so we're, we're sorting through all of these kinds of questions as we're working through this project. One thing that now that we've moved on to is that once we've completed all the very uh, zoomed in analysis of each of the documents, we're writing a research memo for that year. So what are the key emerging um, things that are coming out? And then we're comparing those key emerging issues throughout the years to see okay, how is it being taken up, or is it being taken up somewhere else like that? And that's our, our handwritten um, analysis. Of I can there. see why there's so many of you working on this. That's right, yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's a big project, that's for sure. We don't have funding either, so a lot of volunteers that are very, very interested in just in this. Okay, and then one thing that, that's limited in our work is that this is all our Carville documents. So because this didn't happen too long ago, our next step is to conduct oral histories. Okay, sure. And so we're going to um, try to contact ministry members who are in the, in, in the talks uh, around this policy, um, writing it, um, you know, all of, all of that stuff. So that's uh, phase two when we get there. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about, um, briefly, about our research design. In thinking about, because we're not doing that linear, linearity, we're, we're, we're trying to think of um, those discourses. So we've organized it around, or we framed a bit of our analysis around what, what's called interpretive communities. And, and that is um, groups of people that come together over a particular policy issue. So we're interested in how people are forming really allegiances um, to promote the, something that's of importance to them. So we've, we've um, considered different types of uh, interpretive communities at different levels. So we've named them uh, the provincial, which includes the Ministry of Education, also our Hansard uh, debates that we've uh, got, the MPPs, the letters from uh, the MPPs, uh, provincial organizations, etc. So then we have the board, various boards, but not just various boards, various staff members in the board, um, various board level federations. We have schools, which include students, teachers, principals, local communities, um, heritage language structures, the administration staff. We have the communities, which are children, parents, um, also parent groups, and then also the media. So it, what's important to know is that um, belonging to one of these in interpretive communities doesn't mean that that's where you are. So you could be a teacher, and you could also be a parent, and you could also be um, on the school board. So it depends upon like what the issue is, or what the contention is, um, on how these kind of uh, groups come together. So that's one way that we are thinking about um, our work, rather than telling that kind of linear, linear picture. So now that we've kind of given you an example of more broadly what our research project is, my colleague Kiana um, is going to talk a, a little bit about one of the, the papers that we wrote that has been now accepted into, has just recently been accepted a couple of weeks ago into the Journal of Multilingual uh, and Multicultural Development. So, um, Kiana? Yes. Take it away. Yeah. Is there, is there any questions before I move on to, to the more specifics? Okay, all right. Do you want us to see her? Okay, Hannah, mm -hmm. I'm going to see if I can show show your video. Uh, sure, yeah. Wouldn't it be better to see the slide though? Yeah, maybe. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so, 
So I'll just talk about the paper that we just wrote. Um, and the title, so I start with the title. The title is Linguistic Hierarchization, Hierarchization in Education Policy Development, Ontario's Heritage Languages Program. So I'll briefly talk about how we started this specific paper out of this huge project, out of the sheer amount of data that we have collected. Um, so I was in charge of going through the data, like all the documents um, from the year 1987. So that was the year I was, uh, was responsible for analyzing, like organizing and analyzing. So um, Jennifer, can you yeah. uh, go to the next slide? Yeah. So in the middle of this task, like analyzing, uh, organizing and analyzing the data from 1987, I came across with this specific policy document, this yellow one, um, that Jennifer briefly talked about. So it's called Proposal for Action, Ontario's Heritage Language Program. But we were, su we were surprised to see this document this since the, since the title of the document, the title of the policy document, sounds like the ministry was taking some actions. They were doing something to enhance the program. Um, can we go next? But we were already aware that, first, a number of bills had been introduced to make the program stronger and to raise the status of heritage language education since the instru instru uh, introduction of LTLP, like our uh, heritage language program. So if you see this slide, um, 1977, the ministry first introduced uh, the program, oh, let's have some classes for the students who want to learn uh, uh, languages other than English and French. They can learn those, uh, those languages after class or on the weekend. So that was 1977. But uh, a lot of people, like, especially immigrants, like from um, um, private citizens, they, the parents were not very happy about the stipulation of this program because it was they can only take those classes after school or out or on the weekend. So outside of the regular program, the regular curriculum or regular school hours, and it seems. So that was viewed like, oh, heritage language is not as important as English or French. It was more like an extra thing, extracurricular, after school thing. So a lot of, so four bills in 1978, 80, 82, 86, <laughs> many bills were introduced to make the program stronger and to make it possible for the students to take those classes during those regular school hours. But none of them were successful, none of these bills were successful, and the Ministry of Education was consistently against these bills, against this um, idea of having the Hedge language instruction into the regular school days. The Ministry was to maintain the status quo of the program and they didn't want to make any changes. And that was what had happened during this time, this time period, no changes. To the, to the policy. But all of a sudden, in 1987, the ministry to the public this policy document, the proposal for action. So that was that was why we were so wondering, like, hmm, what action? What action they want to take after all of those like, years, 10 years of doing nothing? So our research question Wait, 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 wait. We can't say doing nothing. Jeff wouldn't be happy with that. Doing very little. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Like uh, raising the fund of it, yep. something like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. um, so our research question started from this seemingly aggressive, uh, seemingly progressive um, policy document in the favor of ending and enhancing the program. Okay, next slide. Um, so the most important piece, again, was um, like from this. From this proposal, the most important changes they were trying to make was that make to make 
offering of those classes mandatory for school boards um, if there are enough to be mandatory. Um, next slide. Uh, one thing I want to say, Hannah, um, okay. what's, what's important to note is that uh, the Bill 80 was in the second reading um, and it was going to go on to the third reading, it would, would be passed, but then all of a sudden the proposal for action came from the ministry. So um, we squashed the bill. Okay. Yeah, so, so then our question is what motivated the ministry to see that of this um, and expect the proposal? Was it really a meaningful step toward or towards promoting language diversity, or was it just a successful prevention of further meaningful steps? Next slide. So as we dig in the data deeper, we found the speech of the ministry's annou uh, minister's announcement of the proposal to legislature. He said, there is concern, however, that some aspects of the of the proposed legislation could fragment the goals and resources we have for the education of Ontario students. So the minister made it very clear that the government did not support the bill. As you find more as you found more documents in the, in the in the data set, we became pretty sure that the timing as Jen or just said, the timing and the content of the proposal derailed efforts to incorporate the uh, heritage language education into the Ontario curriculum. So I'll take, so from here, our paper focused on the discourses that were present both in the general public and within the ministry. Okay, next. So we, went through a lot of like letters from the private citizens or a lot of like, reports um, and media reports. Um, a lot of letters were to um, the ministry or the minister directly or even to the premier um, or um, some kind of politicians. So we collected a lot of of these letters from the citizens or organizations like taxpayer tax payer organizations or uh, teachers federation, those different kind of um, policy actors. And we found there were three different themes that were going on or discourse, three different discourses um, in those general in the general public. So first was finance, for example here, um, not the taxpayer's responsibility. I'm reading from the books, so not the taxpayer's responsibility. This is actually this is actual letter. This is the actual letter that we collected from the archives. So they were talking about this is not our responsibility, financially supporting immigrants um, um, like language, like to educate their children um, for their language, for their home language. And another discourse was racist fragmentation, like it will fragment, uh, it will fragment the whole student body, or it will promote multiculturalism. Um, it is like a politics of the English or French speaking students, things like that. And the last discourse was availability. Is it possible? Is it practical? Can we bust like can how can we since um, be bused to different schools, there could be only one school in the whole city. Again, the this visibility uh, related discourses. Those were the resources that we found from the public, and we were able to argue that these discourses we found in the general public was taken up by the ministry to success prevent the passage of the suggested or introduced bill. Um, next. So for example, this is the ministry internal like then confidential document. Um, I can read from this point, heritage languages and the funding therefore were introduced originally as a political ploy 
by the federal government, and there was no long-term expectation that they should become a major educational vehicle or expense. It was part of it was part of the multicultural heritage era. So these documents that we collected from the archive, it was open. It was not open to the public back then, but now we have access to this uh, this data, and now we can use these documents to back up our argument how they were trying to um, preclude the package for sale and um, to be against of expanding the heritage language program and education program, the heritage language instruction in general. It also said if the CC that utilized the taxpayers' education dollars in the best interest of its citizens in general and each youth in particular and it was clearly an optional extra so um it is just one of the examples that we presented in the paper but this way we was we were able to create a whole different um like documents to back up um, our argument um next slide and it's also quite interesting because um well, we have access to these ministry documents and the public wouldn't be hearing these kinds of communications. This uh, document in specific, specifically was uh, confidential, so we're not certain who had access to this information within the ministry. Okay, so we, this is, so we are going back to the So I just presented like, the overall findings of the paper, but then how is it related to just like, all of the technology? So you are specifically interested in how public discourses were taken up by the ministry to fix the passage of the bill that could have enhanced the state of non-efficient energy. <coughs> um, and, how, and also, how ministry officials made an implicit alliance, temporary alliance, with private citizens and organizations that, um, that were against the bill. So they are not always together, but in this case, at in this specific at this specific moment in 1987, they the Ministry of Fisheries were able to use the discourses already prevalent in the, the public, and then they were able to use those uh, those those discourses as a vehicle, as a discursive vehicle to um, back up their arguments. So official bilingualism and official politics of, of multiculturalism was used as a first uh, vehicle. So this is the genealogical focus here. So we just talked about this continuity uh, earlier in this presentation. So we are, we are more interested in we are more interested in talking about or um, discovering these continuities or potential. So realized or unrealized. So potential discontinuity. So back then in 1987, the bill could have been passed, passed and it could have made uh, this discontinuities in how um, the status of non-official languages or how heritage language uh, language education was perceived by many Ontarians um, back then and it could have been, it could have lasted up to today. So, say because, that again, sorry Hannah, say that last part? It could have. Um, listen, uh, so we, it could, if the bill was passed, it could have had a very long, like long lasting impact on even today's British language education, the status of it. Um, so it also allows us to see how a policy leads in practice that allows us to recover discursive terms on which challenges to the political status quo are made. So there are still a, a group of people, a group of parents who want to make uh, it make it legal to use um, languages other than English and French to teach other subjects um, in Ontario schools. 
but they are still struggling how to persuade the politicians and how to persuade the government and how to make those changes. So by going back to what has happened and what kind of efforts have been made um, to do the same, to make the same changes back in the like 1980s, 1980s, we were trying to anticipate and and, and see what kind of like, like how we differently how differently we can um, pursue what um, like to make the heritage language education more um, available in Ontario. So that that was our focus by using like focus the papers on using this um, this policy technology as a method. Okay, how um, yeah, I'll end it here. So what was that last, using policy, policy genealogy as a what? Method. Okay. Okay, so uh, yeah, we submitted it and uh, it should be out quite quite soon. Can you put your references up? Sure. Yeah, you can yeah, you guys. Thanks, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, discussion? Or question? How, can I just ask that, like, um, I'm not I'm kind of a methods geek here, so and the reason I came uh, to listen to you is I 